Here, just uh, stand, raise your hand, and shoot. Uh, any questions legitimate? Any question about anything? And I'll try to give you a scriptural answer in five seconds or less. Yes, sir. The uh, judgment seat of Christ is in the public or private, between you and the Lord or anybody else see it? Okay. Is that private? All right. Uh, you're talking about the judgment seat of Christ about being private or with everybody else present. Uh, two passages. First of all, get uh, Timothy and get uh, 1 Timothy. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. And the other one, get uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 Timothy chapter 5. And there's one more we probably need, and that'll be in Matthew chapter 18. Now, Matthew 18 is, doesn't make a very good church age passage, but still what's said here uh, is a prophecy. All right, now first of all, we'll read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and notice the judgment seat of Christ has just been discussed. The judgment seat of Christ, the subject matter of everything in the previous chapter from verse 11 to verse uh, 15. 11 to 15. And it says there in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 13, Every work, man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. And that could be a private thing right there, that much of it. But uh, there's some other stuff here. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time till the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Then shall every man, have praise of God in uh, indicating that at some time we'll all know everything about what went on. All right, the next one is Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, verse uh, 15, in the matter of dis selling disputes between brethren. Uh, Matthew 18, 15, More if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If shall hear thou hast gained thy brother. But if you will not hear thee, then take with thee two or three uh, more, one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear thee, tell it them to tell it to the church, as a public thing. But if he neglect to hear the church, public thing, let him be to thee as a heathen and a, a man and a publican. But look at the context. Verily I say unto whatever shall be bound on earth, and that's disputes between the brethren, shall be bound in heaven. Then it's fixed, you'll have to meet it again. If it isn't settled here, it'll have to be settled up there. That binding and loosing wasn't what the Catholics thought it was at all. They thought it was forgiving sins. They're cockeyed as usual. <laughs> 18, whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Referring to what? Verse 15 and 16, disputes between brethren. Uh, whatever you uh, settle down here, doesn't have to be settled up there. If it ain't settled down here, it'll get settled up there. And that's a bound to be a public thing, at least involve two or three people. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse uh, 24. 1 Timothy 5, verse 24. And this again is talking about church matters. Notice in the context 17, the elders that rule well, and the pastor, the ox that treads out the corn, 18. Uh, elders uh, being caught in sin, verse 19, sin, verse 20, 21, uh, treat them without partiality. Now, verse 24, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before the judgment, and some men they follow after. Now, he says, we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin, and cleanse us more than righteousness. So the way a sin goes ahead to judgment is you confess the Lord and it's judged, and that's the end of it. It ain't going to show up again. It's forgiven and cleansed. And then he says, some men they follow after. Unconfessed sins and stuff like that that haven't been dealt with here have to be dealt with up there. 25, likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand. We can tell them before they get the reward for them that you can see them. And they that are otherwise, that are not good, cannot be hid. They're going to come into light. So the indication is there'll be some things up there that'll be settled between you and the Lord and other things that'll be settled before a group, depending upon how many are involved. And my method of dealing with such things is uh, 
is I try to keep my accounts up to record. I try to keep it uh, every day so that at any time in my life, uh, I don't hold anything against a brother. I forgive him no matter what he's done. Now he says, if he repent and come and ask forgiveness, you should have forgive him. I, I beat him to the punch. I forgive him before they come and ask. And that thing is in 1 Corinthians that says, uh, be tender-hearted, uh, tender, kind-hearted, forgiving one another, as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And that way it doesn't have to be dealt with later. Now the only thing against this teaching is the hyper-dispensational teaching that since your sins are forgiven by the uh, atonement, they don't have to be confessed. That's the latest thing going with the sovereign grace people. And the idea is since the, your sins are forgiven for his name's sake because of blood redemption, none of them has to be confessed because they're automatically taken care of. Now, that's a very stupid and dangerous way to treat scripture. Because that, you, there's a difference between your standing and your state. Your standing with Christ is sinless perfection. Your sins are all gone. Your state something else. For this cause, many among you are sick and weak and some sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. When we are judged, we're chastened with the Lord, we should not be condemned of the world. Unconfessed sin is going to get a whipping. The fact that it's paid for in Calvary is immaterial. There's a difference between that and fellowship. Fellowship something else. And it's, the, it's a situation like where if you came home, your boy, you find your house burned to the ground, your wife's dead, and the dogs have been, had gasoline thrown them and burned to death, and your 15-year-old boy says, well, I did it, Daddy, but I'm still in the family, so I know you forgive me. Well, he's going to get a whipping and may have to go to jail. I mean... You're not, about, you're not about to stay in fellowship with a boy that won't admit it's wrong and confess he's done something wrong. He may be your son, but you're not in fellowship with him. And that's the case with the child of God. So those things will have to be dealt with the judgment seat of Christ. I would imagine some of them, some of them are going to be public. All right, something else. Yes, sir. In the Old Testament, Israel's a wife of God. Uh -huh. In the New Testament, we as the church is the bride of does the Holy Spirit have a mate? Is there a picture of a wife or bride for the Holy Spirit? Mm, not that I know of. Turn to Hosea chapter 2. That's a new one on me. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why is uh, Israel in the Old Testament is not likened just to a wife. It was also likened to a son. Hosea chapter 2. Now, the difference between the Bride of Christ and Israel is this. Uh, one is a cast-off wife to be remarried after divorce, and the other one is a virgin bride that's never been married. And the hyper-dispensation get them kind of confused. On Hosea chapter 2. Now, in chapter 2, notice some, how he begins in verse 2. Uh, this put-away wife is put away. She's no... The Lord is no longer living with two wives and all that kind of stuff. Uh, our divorce, a uh, scriptural divorce, is a genuine divorce. And the people who say it's not are, are blaspheming God. Here's what he says about his wife. Hosea chapter 2 verse 1. Say to your brethren, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruama, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife. Put her away. And I am not her husband. There it is. God divorced his wife. Folks said, no grounds for divorce. Well, you're a blasphemer. God divorced his wife and said, don't call her my wife. She isn't my wife. Don't say I'm her husband. I don't care if she still is around. She's not my wife and I'm not her husband. Is that clear? <laughs> Any of you folks have trouble with that? <laughs> All right. Now what's God going to do? He's going to remarry her later. Hosea chapter 2, verse uh, 18. In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the fowl of the heaven, with the creeping thing of the ground, and I will break the bow and sword and battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee, as a remarriage, forever. I will betroth thee to me in righteousness, in judgment, in loving kindness, in mercy. I will betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. But that's the second advent. That's when Israel is restored. Now, but the trouble of this 
marriage thing for the Holy Spirit is, if the Holy Spirit was said to have a wife in the Bible, she's not, uh, the Holy Spirit is not said to have a son. And Christ has, a, has sons, and so does, uh, does God the Father. Turn to Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter uh, 3. And Exodus chapter 3, uh, verse, uh, what's the trouble there? Exodus 4, Exodus 4, 22, is it still on? Oh yeah, the waitresses. When the rapture comes, come up here, they're going to say now or later? <laughs> they're going to say now. They say just the way I am or change uniform. The Lord says, just the way you are right now. They say, should I start head first or feet first? The Lord says, just stay there. Just stay there. Just stay there. <laughs> Exodus 4, verse 22. Thou shalt say to Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Well, as many as received Christ, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, right? So Christ has sons, and uh, God has son, a son, and Christ has a bride, and God has a bride. That isn't all. Sometimes uh, Israel as a nation is called Jacob. You'll find that all the way through the prophets. Jacob, my elect, Jacob, my servant, talking about the nation. So in the Old Testament, the uh, nation of Israel likened to a man, and then the uh, nation of Israel in the Old Testament likened to a wife, and the nation of Israel in the Old Testament likened to a son. Now, all three of those things are true of the church, the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ's bride is likened to a bride, not a wife, and then likened to a man, uh, to become the fullest of the stature of Christ as a, as a complete man. You'll find that in Ephesians. And that's the fullness of Christ. A new man. And then we're likened to a son. As many of us they gave him the sons of God. And as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of God. So those are three things that are true of Christ and and the Father. And if you had to, if you're going to make a similitude to that, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would have to have not only a wife, but a man and sons. Now the Holy Spirit is the author of the new birth, but when the new He gives the new birth, you don't become a son of the Holy Spirit. You become a son of God and a brother to Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit has a peculiar neuter function that neither the Father nor the Son has. Now, the father is called male, that's clear. And the son is male, that's clear. But it's not clear the Holy Spirit is male to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you'll find the Holy Spirit referred to as it over and over again with a small s in the King James Bible many, many times. And even the New Testament, he said, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. So there's a neuter thing in regard to that. And the, and the thing is so strong that the word for father in the Greek is master, and the word for son in the Greek is mask, and the word for Holy Spirit in the Greek is neuter. That's uh, tall pneuma, it's a, a, a second declension neuter. So there's something about the Holy Spirit as a, as a function or operation of God that's not like the Father and the Son. Now, the three persons, I'm a Trinitarian, I'll be God in three persons, I'll be the Holy Spirit's God. For well, the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Holy Spirit is given the same attributes that are given to God, same attributes. But his function is different than the Father and different than the Son, and different in a radical kind of a way. Uh, the, the wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hearest the sound there that cannot tell from whence it cometh, or whither it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. The Spirit's like air or wind. Ezekiel, come and breathe upon these uh, breath, O slain. Prophesy of the four winds, and say, Come, wind, and breathe upon these slain, and they shall live. And I watched them, the Spirit entered them, they stood upon their feet. Now that's the operation of the Spirit, and the Spirit, when you're talking about His work, His function, the neuter is perfectly properly, proper. When you're talking about His person, when He comes, He shall not justify of Himself, but He, 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 He. 
So the Holy Spirit is male too, but not mm, like the Father and the Son. So I've never found a pastor in the New York Testament where it would indicate that. Uh, can you give me one, what you've read or been told? <laughs> well, I, I know why you would, and it would be natural to do that. Because normally, uh, a, 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 a group, the groups always come in three. They always come in three. So you'd be looking for a third counterpart to that. But if it is, I've never seen the scripture. All right, something else. Yes, sir. Would you show me what each of the uh, Jewish feasts typify in prophecy? The Jewish feasts? All right, so... Uh, Take your Bible and turn to Leviticus chapter 23. There are two places they're found. They find Leviticus 23 and Leviticus 25, which are two of the, of the driest places in the Bible. A lot of the Bible is real dull reading. And Luke 23 and Luke, uh, Leviticus 23 and Leviticus 25 are two of the dullest you can get. Uh, this is a strange book, folks. And people, the average, not, the, not, not even the average Christian realize what this book is. I've never been a scholar really told the truth about it. The truth about it is this is not a religious book. This book is a history book. It's a history. And that's why they want to find fault with it. Because if they can find a mistake in history, then they can prove that what it says happened didn't happen. It's a history book. And as a history book, he records stuff in here that doesn't have any relationship to anything. It's just... From us, something like 40 times in the Bible, I'd wonder about it. I mean, you talk about dull. Some of the dullest reading you've ever read in your life is the Bible. Well, I've been through the Bible more than 140 times. I quit counting at 140. I'll just say somewhere beyond above that. But let me tell you something. The first Chronicles, the first 10 chapters, are enough, are enough to drive a, a frog up the wall, man. And there, there, there's chapter after chapter in there that has no significance at all. It's just a bunch of facts written down. You take uh, some of you going to read the Bible through. And when you start to read the Bible through, you get to Exodus 25. When you get Exodus 25, you throw in the towel and quit. You start getting those tatches and loops and couples and the salvage of the curtain folded over the flap with the silver loops and tatches. You, my God, what a thing, man. I mean, who's going to turn television off and, and read that stuff? <laughs> and, 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 and I used to worry about it. I think to myself, why is all that junk in there? Oh, uh, I mean, this is that Ana and Asa who found their father's asses in the wilderness. What this, the, you know, the playoffs, or the, you know, the Stanley Cup playoff of the World Series or what, you know. And, and Ruth bought an ephah of barley home to her mother. What a thing to put in a religious book. I've read religious books. I've read the, the sacred scriptures, Ho Ho, of the Orient. My, my translator over in India, Kumar, who translated for Billy Graham, Richard Vermbrandt, he translated me for 950 uh, pastors, six hours a day. He said, you know more about our religion than we know. I said, well, that's because I studied before I was unsaved. I read the sutras and the Vedas and the Shastas and the Puranas and the Bhagavad Gita and the Kama Sutra and the Tripitaka, all that stuff. I read all that stuff. That isn't like this book at all. I read the Koran through seven times. It isn't like this book. <laughs> the Koran, all those things begin with this philosophical of getting, attaining the ultimate by joining the everlasting, that doing this and don't do this and do do this and don't do that and do this and this, this good, this is bad, and you might get there if you were. You know how this book begins? Two naked people trying to eat something they shouldn't eat. Did you ever see something kind of wild that is? What a way to start a book. The word eat occurs 17 times in the first two chapters. 17 times. Well, chapter 2 and chapter 3. That ain't a religious book. And I used to worry about that. I'd say, why is all this stuff in here? I read one time in the Bible it said, I want to bring you to Palestine, uh, take you a land that is the glory of all lands. I thought, that dump, that goat heap, that's the glory of all lands, Palestine? <laughs> that place looks like West Texas, man. That thing is a goat heap. 
There are no rivers in Palestine like the Missouri and Mississippi. I've seen them all. There are no mountains over there, even like the Gross Glockner uh, over there in, uh, in, in Austria, the Sioux Spitz, let alone Mount Everest, you know, or Mount McKinley or Whitney or one of them. They've got no hills and places place over there like the Ozarks in the fall. Not in Palestine. The Dead Sea and the Dead River and the Dead This and the Dead That and a bunch of carp in there. You, that isn't any, the glory of all lands. A land whose hill drinketh the wain from heaven and milk and honey flow from the... What a thing, man. Now, I've seen, I've seen the sun come up over the poly in Hawaii with a purple coral and pea green. I've cut the bamboo up there, the gooks back there in the back of the Bataan and Corregidor. I've seen the sun go down over Fujiyama in the winter. I've been some places. I know spring chicken. I've, I've been some places. The most beautiful country in the world, Austria. I've never seen a country come anywhere near it. Not even Germany. In Austria, you drive around there and come around a corner, you think you're looking at a postcard. You can't even believe what you're looking at. It's divided off into about 10 places, and each one has a lake. And the lake could be anywhere from 5 to 15 miles long with fresh water, fish in it. Then around that lake will be rich black farmland and then mountains circling the thing with pheasant and deer in the mountains and snow in the mountains. Fifteen sections like that. Uh, Palestine have nothing to do with it. I thought I said to you one time, I said, Ruckman, we'll buy you a round-trip ticket to, to Palestine if you'll be our tour and a guide over there. Could you do that? I said, yeah, I'll guide you over there. I, I know Palestine better than old Florida. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, just give me a round-trip ticket to Frankfurt and dump me off and pick me up on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> and they did it. So I went over there five times. I've been over there six times now. And there's nothing in Palestine come anywhere near Germany or Austria or the United States. But the Lord kept bragging about it. And I thought to myself, why does he do that? And one day I got some light. And the thought occurred to me, why, that's where his son's going to die. A man's interested in his son. Yeah. And that's the glory of all land, because that's where his son's going to come back and reign. So you know what he'll do? He'll waste your time with chapter after chapter in that book with genealogies about people that you never saw and never know and could care less about, and he's interested in them because they're connected with his son. That's it. So if you want to get along with the Lord, brag about his son. Uh, I'm telling you, it's a history book. But there are more chapters in there about Sarah than there is about Caesar. Now, you call out a balanced account? <laughs> Why, the books, there are all kinds of books about the Caesars. Why, he's given about six lines in the New Testament. That's all. Sarah gets four chapters. Who she? She's a Bedouin woman who milked goats out in the pasture. But she's a great great grandmother of Jesus Christ. And that's why this book is unlike any book in the world. There's no book that comes they can't touch the thing. Because it's just a dead, dull history is what it is. And then right in the middle of it up shows this bare, bare resurrection. People say, Oh, well, that couldn't have happened. <laughs> Mythological, it's legend, I think. The reason why God took a thousand years to write this book on with 42 authors and three different continents is so when it's all up to the judgment, everybody's mouth shut. Romans chapter 3 says, when God is judged, when you judge him, that's what the book says, he'll be justified, he'll overcome when he's judged. When he's judged, says the Romans. And the context is, let God be true to a man a liar. The road wrote a history book here, when this thing opens up, he will show in history what took place in here that he recorded, including some guy offering a silver spoon of meat offering and a drink offering and an ox cart full of, of silver and 30 shekels of silver and two goats and four rams and six bullocks right to the number. He knows where the hairs your head are. Now, that's why that book is written this way. But an honestly, man picking up this book, I don't think he'd get anything out of it. I picked it up one time. All I got up was thunder and lightning and stewed down to a fine poison to where I was losing five pounds a day and about ready to blow my brains out. I couldn't find anything in here except unsheeted hell. That's all I could find when I got it. I never got to the good pastures. I just opened the bad one. Of course, I was drunk when I was reading it. <laughs> but this book is a history book. And so you have these dull accounts in here. I mean, they're, 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 I mean, they're really... It, I know by that that God wrote this book because whoever wrote this book knows about life. 
And life, brethren, is not all hop, skip, and jump. A lot of it sag, bag, and drag, as you know. I mean, in the movies, they drive off into the sunlight, the white horse, him and his bride, to the father's house with the orchestra playing and the sunset. But it don't come out that way down here. It comes out here with diaper pails, you know, and the dog puking on the floor and the cat busting the screen, you know, and the kids getting their finger caught in the door. It's A lot of it's... A colored lady said, I sure enjoy them soap operas on the, on the television because that's when the white folks suffer. <laughs> You see, a, a soap opera is the only only thing on radio, on television that's real, because the action never moves faster usually than just time. But when you watch, there are radio, television programs where the movie you're watching covers a period of five to ten years. Some of them carry, cover twenty to fifty years. You can't live fifty years in an hour. You can't live twenty-four hours in an hour. It takes 24 hours to live 24 hours. So most of life, kids, is dull. And the way you get in trouble is trying to pep things up. That's how the kids get in trouble. That's where the speed comes in and the crack. They're trying to get that thing like the TV puts it. It isn't that way. Now, in regards to your question, Leviticus 23 and 25, here are the feats. Well, Leviticus 23, verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations. Here's the first one, verse 5. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. On the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All right, those first two are Passover and Unleavened Bread. And those first two, Passover and Unleavened Bread, uh, those things occur in the first month, Avid. And that first month on your calendar is somewhere between March and April, which is where you are now. And their first month, the first day of their first month is not the first day of March. Uh, their first month is around. It'll change with the Jewish, uh, Jewish calendar on 360 days a year instead of 365. It's a lunar calendar. And so you, their first day of the month is around March the 14th. It isn't always the 14th. Sometimes it's 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, sometimes as far back as the 10th, but it's in the middle of those months. Uh, that's March and April. That's when the Passover is held. Uh, Passover is a picture of the uh, death of Christ, the Passover lamb. All right, then he says in verse 10, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When ye come the lamb which I have given you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits. This is called the feast of the first fruits. And he shall wave the sheep before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath shall the priest wave it. And he shall offer the day when you have the sheep a he lamb without blemish the first year for so, so forth and so on. Now verse 11. This first fruit sheep is uh, offered on the morrow after the Sabbath. Uh, that Sabbath, regular Sabbath, would be Saturday. That morrow after the Sabbath would be the first day of the week, which would be Sunday. First day of the week. And he says in the passage, when this thing here is offered, uh, verse uh, 13, And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenths deal of fine flour, made with oil and offering made of the Lord, so forth, and drink an offering, and so forth and so on. I'm looking for a passage there that says uh, it's to be offered with leaven. I don't see it. Where is that? 18. I want a verse that says, with leaven. Seventeen. Seventeen. Yeah. All oh, right, that's, that's, that's the next one. All right, this, this, this thing here is not given as a feast, but first fruits is mentioned here in this passage. The morrow after the Sabbath. And that'll be a Sunday. That'll be a picture of the resurrection of Christ. That's just uh, waving the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted. It's not a feast. But here comes the next one. 15, and you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, that's Sunday, from the day you brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete, seven times seven. That's 49 days after this. And 49 days after this, then he says, even the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, that'll be 50, that's the word for Pentecost. That's what Pentecost means. It means 50. To the five. 
Pentagram. Pentagon. That's ten times five. That's a fifty. Charismatic said to me, Pentecost is not a uh, is not a, a religion. It's an experience. I said, No, you got it wrong. It's a Jewish feast. <laughs> you got to find out what you're doing. You know. Uh, verse seventeen: You shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves of two tenths deal. Two wave loaves. Jew and Gentile, the Gentile proselytes at Pentecost, and they shall be a fine flour. They shall be baking with leaven. They're sinners in this bunch. Those are saved sinners in that bunch. There wasn't any back there before. That bunch there, that was a feast of unleavened bread. Christ not a sinner. No leaven. The Passover. But you've got leaven here. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Well, then Pentecost are the first fruits of the Lord. That feast to be kept. Well, then you come on down here in verse 24. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall be, you shall have a Sabbath. Well, you've got Pentecost sitting here like this. Now you have a, the seventh month coming up here. The seventh month will be between September and October. And this thing here that comes up seven months is uh, has three feasts in it. Uh, verse 24. You shall have a Sabbath on the morning of blowing of trumpets. A holy convocation. All right, the first fe feast in this thing is called the Feast of Trumpets. That takes place in the fall. All right, then he says, 27, on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. That's Yom Kippur. And the day of atonement is the Jewish New Year. That's their big feast. That's the day of atonement. That's when the high priest goes into the, to the uh, sanctuary and goes to the Holy of Holies and offers a sacrifice for the entire nation. That's the day of atonement. All right, then there's another one. Verse 34. Speak the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days. That shows up. The Feast of Tabernacles for seven days. Uh, Thirty-seven, These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And... Uh, there they are, and I'll come to chapter 25, and there are two more mentioned here, but they're not given as feats, but they're to be observed. 25, 3, six years thou shalt sow thy field, six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, but of the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. All right, uh, once every seven years the land is to rest. And then finally, verse 10, or verse, uh, verse uh, 8. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years. Seven times seven. And when you get to 49 years, at the end of 49 years, just like the end of 49 days, 50, 10, you shall have the 50th year. 50. The match back. Those two match. That one there is 50 days. This one here is 50 years. You shall have the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land. Now, you see that inscription there in verse 10? That's found in the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. The cracked Liberty Bell. That's very significant. It's cracked. <laughs> America's in the same asylum run by the inmates. Literally now. I mean, madness. Madness. O.J. Simpson. I just got the book by the captain they accused of being a racist named Forum, where he gives his evidence, and he says... That thing couldn't have been, there couldn't have been more evidence that against that man unless you'd had a video of the whole thing. <laughs> crazy, crazy, nuts. Uh, letting a fellow like Slick Willie stay in and impeaching a man like Nixon. Yeah, that's right. Alongside, alongside Slick Willie, Nixon was Mother Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, it's a crack Liberty Bell. All right, now, that is Liberty proclaimed throughout the land. That's a Jubilee. That's called a Jubilee. Back in the Civil War days, they say, the masters say, ha, ha, and the darkies say, ho, ho, for it must be that the kingdom I'm coming in the year of Jubilo. Hurrah, hurrah, we'll shout the Jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, we're marching through the sea. da 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 marching along through Georgia. Those dumb, stupid people back in this country a hundred years ago thought the kingdom was coming at the end of the Civil War because the Jubilee was coming in. That's how stupid people are. 
I've had two world wars since then, got two more on deck. Oh, and I hear these things right here. There's this thing here, there's that thing there, there's this thing here. That's just an operation of pictures of the resur resurrection. There's this thing here, there's this thing here, there's this thing here, tabernacle. And then the, these things down here that uh, match uh, Pentecost. Now, what do they signify? Well, this one here is clear. That's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. There's his death and burial. There's his resurrection. The first day after the Sabbath. And that's, a, that's, to be, that's the memorial in this age. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord death till he comes. That's the memorial for the, in this age for the death of Christ. Now, when Christ comes again, this feast is the memorial. Turn to Zechariah chapter 14. In the millennium, you keep this feast. In the church age, you keep this one. This looks back to the cross. In the millennium, this looks back to the second advent. Turn to Zechariah 14. So we know the date of the second advent, if our calendar is right. The date of the second advent is between September and October in the first year of the new century coming up, 2000. Which means if the count is right, you haven't got 60 days to go. And I sure hope the count is right. <laughs> All right, Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, look at the context. Verse 2. Verse 2. Verse 3. You can't doubt the context. Look at verse 3. Second Advent. See the second Advent? How many of you see the second Advent in verse 3? You see it? It's right there. <clears throat> if you doubted it, uh, look at, uh, oh, look at <clears throat> verse 9. <clears throat> there it is, verse 9. Zechariah 14, 9. See it? Oh, now watch this. <clears throat> verse 16. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 18. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not up, they have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 19. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. There it is. That's in the millennium. Now, why is that? <clears throat> Come to Acts 15. Acts 15. <clears throat> we'll try to get these other feasts located, but this is the important one here. Because this dates both Advents. To the birth of Christ and the fall around September 23rd, and the second Advent of Christ, the Mount of Olives, is after the year 2000. Acts 15. Acts 15, uh, verse uh, 15. This is James pronouncing the final judgment on the council of Jerusalem. Acts 15, verse 15. And to this agree the word of the prophets, as it is written. After this, I will return, second advent, and will build again the tabernacle. That's why that feast of tabernacles represents the second advent. Let me show it to you again. Psalm 19. No, date, no, no problem about that date. The Lord tied the second advent date is fixed. The problem is our calendar. Psalm 19. Most of the fellows who, who guess on the rapture guess on the September-October date because of the Feast of Trumpets. And they do that because they think that that angel blowing that trumpet there in Revelation is a trumpet for the rapture of the church. Or they're in Matthew 24 where it says he'll send forth his angel the sound of a trumpet and gather together his elect. So if they're Calvinists, they think the elect is them, which it isn't. <laughs> it's Israel. All right, Psalm 19. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. Now, watch this close. This is a tough one. To declare is to state something. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. And uh, something in that too. I'll draw you a picture of that tonight. When God takes off his clothes. 
I got a message called the streaker. <laughs> when God takes off his clothes and he's going to take them off. Two, day unto day utter speech. Then when the sun comes up in the morning, goes down at night, it talks. It's preaching all day long. Night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice day and night, day and night preach. And anybody, anybody knows their voice, where their voice not heard. Every time the sun comes up and goes down, every time the moon comes up and goes down, the sermon is being preached. Right over your head and you see it. And everybody understands it because it doesn't take a linguistic. They speak themselves. Sun goes east to west. That's against the world. The world goes west to east, right? God goes east to west. So if you're with the world, you're going against God. And if you're God, you're going against the world. And if you're standing still, you're going against God because you ain't standing still. The world's turning. It's all there. In Romans chapter 1, he says, The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So I can see the Trinity. That's why most pagan religions are sun worshippers. Because the sun is a picture of the Trinity. It has light rays. You can feel them, but you, can't, you can see them, but you can't feel them. That's Christ, the sun. It has heat rays. You can feel them, but you can't see them. That's the Holy Spirit. It has actinic rays. You can't see them and you can't feel them. It has a body, soul, and spirit. His body is Christ. That's the light ray. I'm the light of this world. It has heat rays. That's the Holy Spirit. It has actinic rays, soul, and you can't see them and you can't feel them. The sun goes against the world. The world goes against the sun. And the moon follows the sun. The moon's a picture of the church. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 10. The moon follows the church. Uh, the moon follows the sun the church is supposed to follow Christ but the moon is a dead planet it has no light of its own it reflects the light of the sun you see <laughs> I am the light of the world you the light of the world alright verse 4 they're lying that's why you say when somebody says something they hand them a line they're lying what they said verse 3 what they said verse 1 what they said verse 2 their line is going out throughout all the earth. And their W-O-R-D-S. They preach. The heavens preach to the end of the world. Now watch it. Oh boy. In them, in the firmament of the heavens, he has set a tabernacle. A tabernacle. A tabernacle. For who? The sun. Which is as a what? Folks. As a what? Say it again. You know what the bridegroom is? What? Well, Jesus Christ. That's why he's called the Son of Righteousness in Malachi 4. S-U-N. The Son is a picture of Christ. There's a tabernacle for him. Feast of Tabernacles. When he comes back to build the tabernacle. Now, he said the heaven is declared. So, we have this remarkable astronomical phenomenon which every astronomer knows about, but doesn't like to talk about. Here's the universe, or not the universe, solar system, and here's a, the course of the, of the Earth around the sun. And here's the sun sitting here. But the trouble is the sun ain't there. I mean, according to the law of gravity, it should be the center, but gravity, what's that? <laughs> And here's the sun sitting up here. So in the summertime, your, or wintertime, you're 91 million miles from the sun. And the summertime, you're further out. You're 93 million. You say, well, it seems like it'll be warmer then in the winter. No, it's tipped. But it's a tip going around there. So you folks in the winter, even though you're closer, the northern hemisphere is tipped away and the southern hemisphere is getting it. That means they're getting ready for winter down in Argentina now, in Australia. They're getting ready for winter. Fall, they're not getting ready for spring. It's objects, you see. Now, 
The sun is four days off. One, two, three, four. So in Genesis 1, you read, the sun wasn't made till the fourth day. And that's heresy, according to Schofield. There are no Christian scholars in America who think that the earth was here before the sun. There isn't any except one crazy cockeyed nut in Pensacola, Florida. <laughs> I'm the only one that believes the account as it was given. That's proof that you're wrong. Oh, and I'm right and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> Folks say, Robin, you think you're right and everybody else is wrong. Exactly, you got it right on the money. <laughs> the book says, the fourth day, Schofield says, well, it was there all the time, but the light began to appear on the fourth day. Uh -huh. uh, too much education is on. The bigger the belfry, the more room for the bats. All right, now, that is plainly a picture of Christ. The Son of Righteous shall arise in the healing of his wings. When will he show up? He'll show up the fourth day. You say, why? Because one day of the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is the one day, so he shows up there. One, two, three, four. There he shows up. If that weren't enough, you're told that as soon as he shows up, let the water bring forth the creature that hath life, and life shows up the next time as soon as he shows up. Amen. You know what you got? You've got the whole Bible in Genesis 1. Amen. All you have to do is take your whole Bible and just throw it away. Genesis 1. you got to throw it right there. I mean, God made you, Genesis 1, and you're depraved and messed up, Genesis 1, 2, and God thought there'd be light, and the light came, Genesis 1, 4, and then God saved you and washed you in water and made you fruitful, bring forth the whole thing there. Just throw the Bible out, take Genesis 1, memorize, got the whole thing, and the date of both Advents in the first chapter. I'm telling you, there's no book on earth written like that book is written. Amen. There's nothing religious there in Genesis chapter 1 except in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, mentioned God said, God said, but what took place, there's nobody getting saved there. There's nobody going to heaven or hell there. There's nobody told to do anything good or bad. It's a history. I'm telling you, it's a history book. People, if you know something, if you believe that Christ died for your sin, was buried, rose from the dead, and accepted and saved, you go to hell like a bullet. If you didn't. So that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. He says, if Christ didn't come up from the dead, your faith is vain, you're still in your sins, and we're liars. In terms of the question is, did the things happen this book says happen, or did they not? That's the question. So they're always trying to find historical discrepancies so they can get rid of the stuff that they don't like. It doesn't do a man any good to believe on Jesus Christ trusting the Savior. If he didn't die on the cross, if he didn't come up from the dead, you really didn't worth 15 cents. If Christ over there in the tomb rotted away, you really just like Muhammad and Buddha the rest of just some more junk. That's all it is. That's why I was giving that stuff in those songs last night. That song book is empirical scientific proof that somebody is nuts and it's not a Christian. Unless these people have been singing those hymns for 2,000 years are all crazy. I mean, that's proof that that one is not like the rest of them. Do you know what you actually do when you get saved? The stupid thing you do, which I did and I don't repent of, you bet your soul on a book. That's what you've done. You realize that, don't you? You place your soul in the line. You said, I believe the, the account. That's what saves a fellow. If the account is true, you're in heaven. If it isn't, you're just good to hell with the door shut. Keep thrown away. But see, people keep, well, I, wonder, I used to do this, but I don't do this anymore. I, I could have lost it, or I might have not had it, or I think I had faith, but did I believe in my faith, or have faith in my belief, or did I believe in my heart, believe in my head, or I do the worst thing than I did, but look, look, look here. Just rest right there. Amen. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said he shall not do it, have not spoken, have not make it good. Bet your soul on what he said. Amen. Take your chance. Step right this way, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. Put your man inside. Of Spin the wheel, boy. Put the, the whole bundle right on that number right there. Amen. And if it don't work, who cares? <laughs> when nothing else works, 
I've tried the other one. I'm not one of these nice boys raised in a Christian home, you know, and just taking the tradition of my fathers. I tried them. I'm a necromancy, palmistry, extrasensory perception, yoga, cross-legged, samadhi, nirvana, the whole cotton-picking mess. It don't work. Amen. This one works. Amen. See here, here's a guy. See here, see here. Suppose hell went out and I lick a fire right below that piano down there. And burn away, and I'm leaning on this piano. And I'm counting on this piano to hold me up. And if that piano gives way, <laughs> if that piano gives way, I'm a dead duck. We're yeah. all the way on. All I have is a lake of fire down there. I don't want to go there. What am I counting on to keep me out? The finished work of Amen. Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. Period. Amen. No prayer. No tithing. No sacraments. No good works. No being true to my wife. No paying the bills. Amen. No taking care of my kids. All of which I do. But I ain't trusting that. My hope is there was nothing less than Jesus' blood. Yeah, he right. Yeah. I count on it. Yeah. If he didn't die for me, you know where I'm going? Right slap that. Right. right. And if Jesus Christ didn't die for me, then nothing else I can do. That's all I can trust on. Yeah. Now, some of you folks, you like this, and without coming along, say, yeah, but did you really believe it? Yeah. Well, I don't know whether it did or not. <laughs> but did you get slain in the Spirit? Did you talk in tongues? This. Did you feel this? Do you have the feeling now you used to have? Because you've done enough. You take your arm off here and go back trying to do something to get yourself yeah. saved when you're already saved. You just waste your time. Amen. Right. Look at here. If this won't save you, just forget it. Yeah, that's right. right. The devil come in and said, Rock, when you're lost, you're going to hell. I said, Well, maybe I'm having a good time to help him back. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to trick me into thinking I can go back and do anything else to get saved. That's all I got right there. Folks, uh, I have people pull me up all the time doubting the salvation. I tell them the same thing. They don't ever seem to be able to get it. You bet your soul on what he said. Amen. If what he said is so, you're safe. If it isn't, you're not safe. And if what he said isn't so, nobody's safe. We're all going to hell. <laughs> have a good time going together. <laughs> you talking that way, people, that Ruckman, he's so crude. He's, no, man, I just got good sense. I mean, I know when you've done the best you can, that's all you can do. And the best you can do is finish, trust the finished work of Jesus Christ for your sins, and you can't do any better. Amen. So don't worry, don't worry about it. Now that date is September 20th, that one's 21, that one's 22, and that one's 23 on our calendar. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. At the Feast of Tabernacles, they were told to dwell in booths. B-O-T-H-S, made out of branches. So in Middletown and Dayton and Cincinnati every year, around September and October, they put up little booths and called a fair and observed the Feast of Tabernacles without knowing it. <laughs> that book tells you when to get up in the morning when to go to sleep. And the fact you don't believe it's absolutely immaterial. You still don't believe it. Who cares whether you do or not? It's going to run you anyway. <laughs> you take that thing right there, you set that thing right there. Let me show you how wild that is. That Jewish calendar goes March, April, April, May, May, June, June, July, July, August, August, September, September, October, October, November, November, December, December, January, January, February, February, March, March, April. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve 12 months. Your calendar doesn't run that way. Keep on January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. And you call December the 12th month. But it isn't. It can't be. There isn't any college graduate in Ohio that can count to 12. <laughs> because December is a decimal. It's 10. And a novena is 9. And who hasn't ever seen an octopus, an octagon? It's eight. And set is seven. The seventh month. All Americans of Jer go by a Jewish calendar and don't even know it. <laughs> is that why? I mean, you know that thing is set. You take, uh, you take, uh, you take, uh, 
uh, Einstein, Dreyfus, Fortzak, Zeeman, Ott, Noin, Sane. You see? Spanish. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis. Siete, ocho, nueve, diez. Right? But nobody can count. <laughs> I mean, there isn't a newspaper in America even knows what month it is. <laughs> they say that, that, that right now they say this is the third month. You're crazy, it's the first month. Because the rest of them laid out the same way. Now the question is, on this thing right here, when Christ comes, the Word of God, the Word of God tabernacled in the flesh. So when he came down, he came down to the Feast of Tabernacles. September 23rd. When he comes back, he comes back the same day. That's why the shepherds in the field abiding by their flocks at night, because it's the fall, and they're out there, still out there in the pasture in the fall, it's September. So down in our church, sometime around September, we'll sing, Oh, come, all ye faithful. <laughs> upsets folk bad, man. Up Shake some bad boy. Have a, have a fit, man. Get real upset, you know. Joy to the world, Lord, it's coming. <laughs> September. <laughs> But that's the date of both Advent sitting there. Now here's another way you know it. When Christ is crucified, he's about 30 when John baptized. About. Or right, John gets him baptized and he gets tested for 40 days. And then when he first begins his ministry, he's 30. And he goes to 31. And he goes to 32. And he goes to 33. And at 33 and a half, he's crucified. There's tabernacles, 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 Passover six months after tabernacles. One year, two years, three years, and a half year. Get to John, you'll find four Passovers in John. One there, one there, one there, and the fourth one, Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb. So his ministry lasts 42 months, three and a half years, like the Antichrist will imitate. 42 months, three and a half years. So Christ's birthday is tabernacles in the fall. And his advent is tabernacles in the fall, and it's in the universe. It's set up in the solar system. And that's why the scholars just don't like to talk about it. It's embarrassing to have that thing work out that way, and that's how it works out. All right, now he asked about what are the significance these things are. Well, that thing there is the death of Christ, and that's a memorial in this age looking backwards. Uh, this thing here is a picture of the... Uh, 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 first fruits that come up when Christ comes up after the, the dead uh, on Sunday. This one here is Pentecost and the Holy Spirit comes down. So it stands to reason that the Holy Spirit will probably go up the same day he came down. At least I've taught that for a good while, although I'm beginning to kind of move over another way now. now I'm kind of a fella. When I, when I uh, see something in the Bible that contradicts what I believe, I always alter my belief to fit the Bible. And as a consequence, when you see me changing a doctrine, it's because I've decided my system didn't work, and I don't care whether I look like a liar or not, I pray all the time for God to give me wisdom, and I pray all the time for God to correct me where I'm wrong. I don't want to teach false doctrine. Amen. I don't want to stand for the judgment seat of Christ and, and not be able to say I have penitently declared the thing as it is, Job chapter 26. I don't always know how it is. I mean, I haven't got all the answers. I'm human, I'm fallible like anybody else. But I pray for God to correct me where I'm wrong, and where I'm wrong, I correct myself and leave the book as it stands. The other scholars correct the book and make it fit their system. They'll go to the Greek to fix it up so it'll match their system. I'll change my system. Folks say, well, you admit you're wrong then. Well, all right, when you have to admit it, you have to admit it. But I'm not going to make a liar out of God. Let's make a liar out of Ruckman, but not out of God. Let God be true and have man a liar. So that thing goes. I always try to fix it up and make it match their way of doing things. Uh, I change my way to match what he says in the book. And this thing here is, is involved. I've always thought he'd probably go up the same day he came down, but uh, one of my students who graduated years ago has been doing a lot of study on this, and he says this. This is, this is a radical new thing, and I've been working on that about two years. If I'm thoroughly convinced it's right, I'll teach it instead of what I've been teaching. But I'm not, there's a couple of things about it I haven't got cleared up yet. If I get him cleared up, I'll teach him. But he says this. 
We all know that time goes along here and then out here somewhere is Daniel's 70th week of seven years. Now we all agree on that. That's Larkin and that's uh, uh, Robert Anderson. We read there are 69 weeks between the commandment and there's a seven year period sitting out here. Now this fellow says this. He says there's nothing to tell you that uh, the 69 weeks stop here. So he says three and a half of that seven was taken care of in the life of Christ, which is three and a half years. He says the tribulation you're waiting for is only three and a half years long. So there's half of it was back here. Now, the two objections to that, neither one of them hold water. And the first objection is, well, you're teaching a mid-tribulation rapture. That isn't tribulation. That's Daniel's 70th week. These people keep forgetting that. They keep, they, they, in their mind, they've got this thing out where you've got seven years of tribulation, tribulation three and a half, and then great tribulation three and a half. That's interesting, but that isn't, that isn't the book. Now, you go home today and read Revelation. You know what you find in Revelation? 42 months. 42 months. 1260 days. 1260 days. Time, one year. Times, two years and a half time, three and a half. There is no seven years in the book of Revelation. It's three and a half every time it shows up. It shows up four times. You read Revelation 11, 12, and 13, that thing three and a half years occurs four times. And it's never seven. So Daniel's 70th week could have looked like that. Now the good thing about that thing is the fact that if that's true, the church has no part of Daniel's 70th week at all. And it shouldn't. Because that's the time of Jacob's troubles. Not the church. <laughs> You don't have any body of Christ showing up here like chapter 2 after this thing is over and the church will be caught out before that thing starts. Yeah. Now that thing is, that thing's tough. I mean, I've checked a lot of things. So what about the son of the perdition? The son of perdition is there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John 17, 12. None is lost except the son of perdition. He's there. Now the fellow got that thing going as a fellow out in, uh, he's out in Dakota now named Rowley. And he says this. He says when he says we keep thinking the Bible, we keep thinking the Bible says he'll make a covenant with the Antichrist and then break it in the middle of the week, but it didn't say that. And I got checking the passage in Daniel two, and it didn't say that. You know what it said? It said this, Daniel chapter nine. Daniel chapter nine, verse twenty-seven. It didn't say make a covenant with anybody. It said in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. There's Daniel seven, seven years. In the midst of the week, after three and a half, before the next three and a half, he shall call the sacrifice oblation to cease, and so forth and so on. He'll confirm the covenant. Now, Riley says this. And on this, I think he's right. Turn to the Psalms and Galatians. And this covenant, instead of being the New Testament, which all of them think it is, is not the New Testament at all. It's the covenant God made with Abraham and the Jews. And that's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, for this thing here, I'll get uh, Psalm uh, 105. And Galatians chapter 3. Now see where I'm heading? I remember the fact that the rapture has to be in the next 60 days. Because if he's come back at Tabernacles, it has to be three and a half years. And Tabernacles comes up in September. And three years from the next September, land you right up in the year 2001. So this is your last shot that you can guess at. Now, I've made a agreement with my people. I told them if the Lord doesn't come by June, the end of May, you won't hear me ever again <laughs> take a guess as to when he's coming. Because if he doesn't come before June, all this figuring here won't work. If it shows something's wrong with our calendar, if something's wrong with our calendar, you couldn't figure the thing anyway. So you understand I'm making these guesses on an assumption. I'm not a date fixer. I don't go up in a white sheet and stand on the hill and wait for it to come. I keep out on doing what I'm supposed to do. Somebody, some ruckman's a date setter, you know, he said he'd come back in 1989. I was saying of the kind. 
I said if Christ was born 4 B.C., first conditional clause, if he was born 4 B.C., and if our count is right, second conditional clause, 1989 is the latest possible date, and it would be. If he was born in 3 B.C., the late, latest possible date would be 1990. If he was born in 2 B.C., it would have been 1991. If he was born in 1 B.C., it would be 1992. If he was born when he was born, it would have been 1993. See? But he didn't come. So uh, those, that's irrelevant. The only question is, now, how much time is left? There's exact three and a half years left if you quit counting at the end of uh, May. And if you go beyond that, there's no, there's no way to figure anything. So if it doesn't come this time, I'll just tough it out. Boy. I'll say, well, beats the fire out of me. Let's go ahead. <laughs> they, said, they said Luther one time. They said Luther, they said, but you see, you're supposed to want him to come. You're supposed to be looking for him. You're not supposed to be looking for the tribulation, the Antichrist, and Daniel's 70th week, and all this junk. Our conversation is in heaven, and from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Looking for that glorious appearing of the... See, we're looking for him. I said, Ruckman, what if you try to be wrong again and he doesn't come? How will you feel? I said, I'd be very disappointed he didn't come. <laughs> I'm not disappointed I've missed the date. I don't care when he comes. Suppose he comes right now and makes a lie out of me. Fine with me. <laughs> I want to see him, you know, not be see something work out right. <laughs> All right, now watch this thing, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse uh, 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet it should be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Not Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Verse 17, and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed, now nah, we're getting somewhere. He said, Daniel, he'll confirm the covenant. I say the covenant was confirmed before of God and Christ, the law. Uh-oh, that covenant was set up before the law, which was 430 years after. It cannot disannul that it should be, make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but it was given to Abraham by promise. That's a covenant given to Abraham. Let's see what it is. Psalm 105. This is the covenant the Antichrist will confirm. It's already there. He doesn't make it. It's already there. He just confirms it. Psalm 105, verse 7. Now I'll begin at verse 6. This is Old Testament. Psalm 105, 6. O ye seed of Abraham, his servant. O ye children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God, the judgments are on all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac, and confirmed the same to Jacob for a law to Israel, to Israel, 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 for an everlasting covenant. What is it? Verse 11 and 12. That's the covenant. It isn't the New Testament at all. It's the land grant given to Abraham. The Antichrist will confirm it and then go against it. That can still be in the future. All right, now this thing here is set up this way, and oh, you're still on the feast now. We come down to here, and we're trying to figure out here in regard to the rapture, a possible date there, but there's one big trouble. If you figure here from one, two, three, and a half, you don't get six months in there. You'll get, you'll get six months to there, but you won't get six months to here. Because Pentecost is 50 days after that. Now, if you go from Tabernacles, September, October, October, November, November, December, December, January, January, February, February, March, and you get up in there by it. But 50 days after, that would take you March, April, April, May, take you up in there eight months. If you're going to go and even 42 months from Tabernacles, you're going to land on the Passover. Would make the rapture of the Passover instead of Pentecost. Which would mean that if that were true, I think that Jewish uh, Passover this year on a little old diary I bought was uh, the Wednesday before Good Friday. 
Is that next Wednesday? Next Wednesday. <laughs> now, wouldn't that be wild? Wouldn't that be a wild one? They said Luther one time, they said Luther, they said, what would you do if you knew the world was coming to an end tonight or tomorrow? He said, I'd just go right on holding my patched potatoes. You know what he meant by that? He meant, although we're to look for him, we're to be found doing what he wants us to do when he comes. Occupy till I come. The thing is, you shouldn't have to make any radical change. If you've been living right. That's all he's tricked. Chris, boy, if I knew he was coming one tonight, I'd really do this. Why haven't you done that before? Amen. <laughs> you know what I'd do? Just what I've been doing. I wouldn't change the matter. I wouldn't change what I'm doing. You're supposed to be ready for him any time, not suddenly before Wednesday night. <laughs> I mean, he says to John, he says, let us, John says, let us abide him. We not, my mind not be ashamed of his coming. Amen. Now, if that thing is Passover, then you haven't got, you haven't got two weeks to go. If it's Pentecost, you have to wait a little bit longer, up into May. But if May pass, you don't come. <laughs> drive the boat to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> now, folks, let me add just one or two things. In the first place, uh, if the calendar is not right, it could make a great deal of difference. Because it couldn't be more than two or three years off, because of the speed things are going, it can't run another five years. They've got the clone, they got the chip, they got the implant. You've been taking the number for 15 years in Middletown. The numbers on the barcodes and all the groceries. 666. Six, six. Beep, 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 beep. 666. Six, six. Three million times a day for 15 years. The numbers there, the setups there, the EC, the cable, the satellites, all set up. All they're waiting for is the man to show up. And the man's going to show up be the devil incarnate. So it ain't going to run that long. When I go in these prisons and preach these fellows, they told me about how much time they got to do. I say, I don't think there's a man in here that's going to finish two years. So you fellows can do two years. That ain't a hard time, two years. I mean, uh, I don't think everybody's going to make two years. I tell those fellows, in less than a year, you're going to see the biggest jailbreak you ever saw, and you're not going over the fence, man. You're going straight up to the ceiling. They old color barred him and say, that sounds like a winner to me. <laughs> I mean, I, I enjoy preaching the jails. I must confess I enjoy it more than preaching to church people. I'm much more relaxed in the jails. I get the nice thing that comes to my head, man. I mean, I say it, boy, and I'm at home doing it. Like I say, I've, when I was a boy, I'll, I'll bet this a minute, I haven't finished the peace yet, but I've still got a break. Uh, when I was a boy coming up, uh, my idols were Mad Dog Vincent Cole and Jack Legs Diamond. And Al Capone and, and uh, Tony Arcardo and Lucky Luciano and Vito Genovese and Albert Anastasia and Machine Gun Kelly and Dillinger and Put a Boy Floyd and Homer Van Meter and Ma Barker's boys. I like those guys. I like the bank robbers. I like the bank robbers. I've always thought banks were crooked. I still think that. <laughs> but I had to get me a bunch of different role models when I got saved, you know, so I got me some different role models. But I'll, I'll just confide with you, just frankly, between uh, us and the 20,000 people listening to this tape. Uh, uh, if I was an unsaved man and didn't believe in God or heaven or hell or the Bible, I'd be a hit man in the mafia. That's what I'd do. I'd hire out a killer. I'd kill him. Good pay. Interesting work. Adventure. See the world, you know. And folks say, what a thing. Well, if there's no heaven or hell, what's the difference? And that's how they figure. The mafia figures everybody is crooked. I believe that. That's a fundamental of faith with me. I think the HRS and the, and, the, and the EPA and the ACLU are just as crooked as a dog's hind leg. I think the Justice Department is licensed mafia. Amen. And they're licensed to seize, break, assault, and enter without warrant and kill you and your wife and your kids. They murdered 17 children under 18 years old in Winko, Texas. Nobody raised an eyebrow. 17 kids under 18, 10 of them were under 12. They didn't have any weapons. They got a license to kill. They're killers. I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's no mafia, Luciano, John Gotti, oh, Joe Bananas, Bonanno, and that family. There isn't a killer in that mafia who ever lived that you could pay to murder unarmed children. 
but Janet Reno would do it and brag about it. Yeah. Now, that's how that's how mafioso looks at it, and that's how I look at it. And those guys in prison, I know what they're thinking. They're thinking the guards are crooked, and a lot of them are. <laughs> they think the warden is crooked, and some of them are. They think the governor is crooked, and he is probably crooked. <laughs> You see, that's your danger. The danger is you look around and you find an alibi to sin, see? Yeah. And they'll go, well, they crooked and they get away with it. So I'll be crooked. I'll, see, that's, I know how they figures. I got that kind of mind. I think just like they do. And the only thing that makes me different is I believe this book. So we get along real good. And I preach, we get going. And I'll be preaching when we'll kill a boy down the front row and say, what'd you say? <laughs> and I'll say it again. He said, would you explain that? <laughs> right in the middle of the sermon. I'll explain it, thank you, and <laughs> go on with the message. <laughs> I, preach them, I preach them on prison. These old boys, I send, I send them $2,000 worth of literature a year, these prisoners, about 150 of them. And when, they, when I come to the prison to preach, and the ones that know me will wave their books up there, you know. <laughs> Ruckman's Commentary on Matthew, Ruckman's Commentary on Genesis, you know. And I forget one prison I was preaching at, a big old black boy down the front row, about 300 pounds, sat there, he's, he's miffed about something too much charismatic black Muslim something. He forgot just more of the same coming in. And I got going. He sat there in front like this. Pretty soon he went. I got you. About 15 minutes he said, uh, I made some remark about Michael Jackson. I said he was a neuter, a man from outer space, a mystery program or something. And I said, he ain't white, he ain't black, and he ain't male, and he ain't female. And that big old boy down there said, that's right, he ain't white and he ain't black. <laughs> and then about five minutes later, right in the middle of the sermon, that guy got up and said, Lord of mercy, I told you the Lord going to send us something good. <laughs> 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 I'm preaching away and I'm going away there, you know, and I said, are you a thief? And I saw a couple of white guys back there looking at each other. And <laughs> they weren't in for stealing that probably assault and robbery or something, you know, they were in for stealing. And they said, uh, and I said, did you ever steal the bloom of purity off a young girl's cheeks? And I saw those tame two guys look at each other. <laughs> and then I said, did you ever steal ten years off your mother's life living like the devil? And out loud, that congregation, about 70, I heard that guy say, I never thought about that. <laughs> They're right with you. They ride right with you. And I'm going through there, and I say, you can trust God's righteous or trust your own. You're going to trust your righteous or his. And about 10 of them say, trust his, trust his, trust his, trust his. I wish my people go like that. My people don't go like that. Sit there and blink at you like a tree full of owls. All right, anyway, back on this thing here. Uh, do you know why that Passover is a better bet than this one, including the fact that it's an even three and a half? The night of the Passover, they left Egypt. Exodus. <laughs> and those people were under grace. They weren't under the law. That's right. The law hadn't been given. And Exodus, the type of the, Egypt, the type of what? The world. <laughs> and out you go. Yeah, man, out you go. I've always taught that. I always taught the type of the rapture. But I know it didn't seem to be inconsistent until I got looking at that thing and. That thing there, that's a better theory than the other one. That one is closer. But like I said, if that theory is true, you ain't got a week to go. Whatever you got going to get done, you better get done quick. <laughs> now this trumpet, see that one there? That's usually given us for the rapture, and it is a rapture, but it's not a rapture of church age saints. That's a rapture of tribulation saints that takes place over here. And I have nothing in Matthew 24 about the church at all. The way you know that is in Matthew 24, he said, The Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. Paul never used that expression, the Son of Man. In 13 Pauline epistles, the expression, the Son of Man, doesn't occur a single time. That's a Jewish designation. We're not waiting for the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the Jewish Messiah come to Israel. We're waiting for the Son of God, who's our head. Amen. Our head and Lord is a little different. So that thing there is something that takes place in the tribulation, and when the end of tribulation comes, the Jews are forgiven, and they're restored, and the Lord lands on the ground and sits down at the, on the throne of David. That's how those feasts are laid out with the four. Oh, I have something else. Yes, sir. Yeah, I know 
If the Bible what? Oh. Oh, glory. Yeah, okay. Well, I will get into that. I'll turn to Joshua, chapter 9. Now, I get the material from Cleveland uh, University by a friend of mine. I forget his name now, but he sends me mail pretty regularly. And he's trying to get me, get me to go on uh, geocentricity instead of uh, heliocentricity. And he may be right. Well, I've had some reservations about it, and I'll show you why. I'll make this, uh, make this Joshua 10 instead of 9. And there are all kinds of verses in the Bible that would prove that it's, uh, it's uh, uh, geocentric. Now, geocentric means this. Geocentric means the earth is sitting right there like that. And this is the sun going around the earth like this. That's geocentric. That's just geology is the center. Geographic, the center. I mean, the earth is the center and the sun going right outside. Helio, that's helios, that's the sun. You, you take those Greek and Hebrew words and Latin words to show, show, show folks your educated, see. Terrestrial, intraterrestrial, you know, heliocentric, geocentric, stegosaurus, triceratops, you know, pterodactyl, you know, quarks, quasars, you know. You know. Boy, ain't he smart. Now, you know something? A college education is simply paying to learn a bunch of words you didn't know. Amen. And some people think, amen. And, and, and some people think the more words you know, the smarter you are. Sometimes the more words you know, the dumber you are. Uh, wisdom, brethren, doesn't lie in just knowing a bunch of words. There are old goats back in the mountain, old squirrels and goats back in the mountains of Carolina my age that uh, never finished the fourth grade, and they could trade you out of your eye teeth. They got a brain just as sharp and clean as a razor, but they just, this ain't had nothing, ain't, ain't got nothing either, not much more doing around here, you know. You got fellas sure is dumb. Don't bet on it, don't bet on it. Uh, you take your dumb Americans went over Vietnam, they figure if they fought against the people who were 90% illiterate and little old dwarfs with varicose veins for carrying too big a load in their legs and dug around the ground, they figured they'd whip them with a modern mechanized army. You'll, we lost our shirt. When it, comes to, when it comes to taking care of yourself, everybody's smart. Comes survival of the fittest. Those are the fellows way to take care of themselves that you couldn't even use. But that, you know, if I had time, I ain't got it. But if I had time and, and, and uh, eyesight, and I haven't got that either anymore, good enough to do it. But if I had the time and eyesight, I would, uh, I would go back and rewrite all the college textbooks. And I would destroy the educational industry. Destroy it. Just destroy it. I mean, every, you have to close every university in America. Just shut them up overnight. I'd go back and then rewrite all the textbooks in language that a 12-year-old could understand. And just destroy the whole system. You wouldn't say the neutron, the proton. you say the, the new part and the first part. That's what pro is before, and new is noi, and noi is news is the new part. And you wouldn't have uh, the fibula and the tibula and the sternum, you know. You'd have the, the he bone connected to the shin bone, the shin bone connected to the knee bone, knee bone connected to the thigh bone. Now here, what are the dim bone, dim bone. Go. I mean, I'd fix them up good, man. These, you know, if you've got a hurt or a sore someplace in your body, you're making $100 a week, you go there and he'll say it's gout. If you're making $200 a week, it's rheumatism. If it's $500 a week, it's uh, bursitis. You know, they've got a little name to fit each income bracket. <laughs> well, a doctor told me one time, he said, lipotropic activity simultaneously minimize the possibility of gastric irritation due to vascular diseases, but methionine ought to be synergistically potent, must be converted veto to methionine because it contains an emulsifying faction. <clears throat> I said, what'd you say? He said, I said, we've got a pill here that can cure, you, cure a bellyache without giving you side effects. But you couldn't sell the pill for that, see? You couldn't charge $20 for the pill if you said that. Don't you see? The love of money is the rule of all evil. You pay for what you don't know. You pay for what you don't know. And each one of these trades had this trade terminology. The latest gaffed act is the computer. That is the biggest, most phony bunch of junk you ever saw in your life. You've got to get a book that thick to learn the terms. All they mean is push a button. You want this, push that button. You want that, push this button. You want this, push that button. Push number one, push number two, push number three, push three A, push two A, push two B. 
Put a Windows software, floppy disk. I blow it out your nose, man. That's a bunch of folks just going. There's an overkill, just going crazy in that kind of stuff. And it's a, it's a tradesman terminology. It don't mean anything. Did you ever hear three blind mice were sighted by the college professor? A trio of sightless rodents. A trio of sightless rodents perceive the unusual manner in which they perceive the scamper about. They hastily pursue the agriculturalist spouse who proceeded to sever the extremities with a carving utensil. In all your natural born days of existence, did you ever perceive such an unusual phenomena as a trio of sightless rodents? That's three blind mice, see how they run? They all ran after the farmer's wife who cut up the day with a butcher knife. Did you ever see something in your life as three blind mice? But boy, didn't it sound classy? That's why, that's why they make up those words, they can charge you. Or now, heliocentric means the sun, the center, geocentric means the earth, the center. Or now, in the Bible, all the statements are made from the standpoint of geocentricity. That the sun rises, so it moves over it, and then it sets goes down. Joshua chapter 10, uh, Joshua praying to God, verse uh, 12. Then spake Joshua the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still, like it had been moving, upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. All right, they got a problem there. Both of them stood still. I don't care how you take it, heliocentric or geocentric, you're going to have a problem with that one. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, till the people had avenged themselves upon the enemies. It's not written in the book of Jasher. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. That picture of the sun is coming up and moving, and then stopping, and then after time goes by, then going on down. But the reason why that doesn't prove anything is that's exactly what your morning newspaper says in 1998. Sunrise. 5.30, sunset, 6.45. So the fellow here used the same language you use. Why would he be teaching something that wasn't true? In other words, the Bible can use the same language you use and folks say it's not scientific, then neither is yours.